minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Shuttle and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Wow. <clears throat> An amazing, amazing sight, no matter how many times you have seen it. And we are anticipating that we are going to see that uh, coming up uh, around uh, 1130 or so. Uh, the uh, countdown clock right now is in a holding pattern uh, at uh, T minus nine minutes. Again, that's a hold. Uh, ignore the uh, the nine minutes on there. We just got word that the uh, the weather is a green for go. That means the weather is good enough for a launch at this point right now. Uh, let's check in with Ed Lavendari in Mission Control. Ed. Hi, Anderson. Well, it's been really interesting here in Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Over the last few minutes, you really kind of, even from our perch overlooking these guys working inside Mission Control, the intensity level rising a little bit. They're still very calm, but a lot of these guys, and I'll just give you a sense of what we're looking at, these guys in, in, in the back two rows here, uh, we'll focus on, on the front row. There, You see two, two gentlemen there. On the one on the left with the white shirt, Tony Sakachi, the gentleman to his right with the dark hair, that is Richard Jones. He's the flight director. He's the man that will make the decision. They've been standing up the last few minutes, a lot of consulting going on. Um, we're told they're probably going over a lot of the flight rules and exactly what's going to happen and what different scenarios might play out here within the next hour. So they're going over a lot of that. We're able to listen to a little bit of the conversations that they have. They've been talking to each other they went, just a little while ago. They went around the room making sure, checking all the systems on the space shuttle, making sure everything was where it needed to be. We kept hearing, we're a go, we're a go, went around the room. But the focus still remains the weather. We've heard uh, Richard Jones talking to many of the people who are monitoring the weather and we've heard them being really concerned about uh, storms that could be popping up or bad weather that could be popping up to the southwest of the uh, Kennedy Space Center there and, and, and the launch site so that's where they're where they're focusing a lot of attention they're getting updates constantly in that room but it's been really fascinating to watch here in the last few minutes Anderson the intensity level has uh, started to pick up among these folks as we're getting closer and closer to, to launch time and you see these these uh, these these uh, conversations that they're having uh, re really picking up and talking about what's going to be transpiring going down going on here over the course of the, of the next hour uh, Ed, we'll continue to check in with you. Uh, I'm joined uh, here on set by uh, CNN's John Zarell, who's covered uh, many dozens uh, of dozens, launches at dozens. this point. Also, uh, astronaut Katie Coleman and Senator Bill Nelson, uh, who's also been uh, been up in space. You're, as you said, your flight was delayed multiple times. What is that like, all that anticipation, then suddenly there's a hold? It, it, what's the, mentally, what is that like? Well, it got to be old hat climbing in the orbiter. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the jokes, uh, one of our crew members, Steve Hawley, uh, <laughs> felt like he was the jinx. And so the fifth try, when we actually launched, he put a disguise on uh, so that the orbiter wouldn't know that it was him. Uh, you know, I flew with but, Steve, too. Uh, it's, you know, these folks, these professional astronauts are so terrific. Uh, and they have such a terrific sense of humor. And you think about it, Anderson. It is therapeutic. A lot of these people, they're on the edge, pressing the edge of the envelope all the time, and humor serves as a function to reduce the tension. Four, four astronauts aboard this flight, Commander Chris Ferguson, Doug Hurley, Sandy Magnus, and, uh, and Rex Walheim, all, all incredibly experienced in space. Absolutely. In fact, Sandy has lived on the space station, which makes her a really valuable asset for this mission where they've got a lot to do. They're delivering a lot of supplies to the space station. It doesn't help if you deliver supplies, but you don't put them in the place that you're supposed to. Right. She's, nobody she's the can payload master. She is uh, the load master, we call her. The load master. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, and it's like 8,000 pounds of food and equipment that, that they're bringing up. And then they also bring used equipment back down. Exactly. But, you know, sometimes things that have failed, you know, unexpectedly unexpectedly helps us understand what happened to them so that we can build things more correctly. You were just on the International Space Station. How it's long true. were you on there for? I was up there for six months. Six months. Now, now, from the pictures I've seen, it looks like a nightmare to me. I mean, it looks like my, it just looks small <laughs> and miserable. But you say it's amazing. You know, we're keeping it as a carefully held secret. <laughs> but, but really, the, you know, the reality is that it's it's amazing. Really? It is huge. It's, it's as big as the inside of a 747, if you added up all really? the volume. See, it doesn't come off that way out after module uh, and, and and actually have more space in three dimensions than uh, you would if you were just you know walking around we, we're flying around not uh, just floating but flying there is a japanese experiment module columbus is the european experiment module the u.s lab 
a node, which is a place where we, you know, different things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the last missions just brought up the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer that's outside, but also the one before that brought up the PMM, our permanent logistics module, basically a big, huge closet that we really needed. And you went up in uh, the Russian space uh, ship, the Soyuz, and you went back down. And that's really the future. NASA is going to be paying uh, Russian uh, space program to send astronauts up and back in Soyuz. You know, I hate to say it, but the reality of what we're doing now is we've spent a long time building a space station, and it is there. Six people are living in it. It's orbiting the Earth all the time. We have all the power, the data, the experiments, and spare parts that we need to do a lot of good work that can't be done down here. And so it's a pretty exciting time for the space station, and they'll be glad to get what uh, Atlantis is bringing today. Yeah, we, we talked about some of the things that are, are going to be happening over this next year in terms of unmanned space flight. I just want to specifically, the, uh, the Dawn spacecraft is going to go around an asteroid later this month. Uh, Juno mission to Jupiter and also the Mars rover is launching at the end of the year. Yeah, and that's a big one, that Mars rover. It's like the size of a Volkswagen, they say. Huge. It's an enormous rover with all kinds of science capability. Uh, you know, it, it, it makes the old Pathfinder, which is about this big, uh, really just dwarfs those. Do you worry, Senator Nelson, uh, as someone who, you know, represents Florida, and obviously there's huge economic impact for the people in Florida of, of this program continuing, um, that without a, a clear... I mean, you, the mission is Mars, but without the technology at this point, without the, um, the, the ability at this point to get to Mars, that Congress will continue to kind of defund space programs? Because of the economy yeah. is the big fear, that the need to cut back this huge deficit, and how are you going to allocate those cuts? Now, I think the Senate will restore a lot of the cuts that the House of Representatives did, but uh, no doubt. Uh, we don't have a Cold War with a mortal enemy, the Soviet Union, that we're trying to beat to the moon. And so you don't have that incentive. But Anderson, you asked the question of any American, do you think we ought to have a vigorous, successful space program? And you will get a very affirmative answer. President and Obama has said that he wants uh, NASA to focus on bigger picture things, on longer range things like Mars, like an astronaut, uh, asteroid and let more commercial uh, flights deal with uh, kind of a near-Earth orbit. And that's the two lines of rockets. The commercial, that will be the space taxi that will go to and from the station. Then the big rocket that will let NASA do what NASA ought to be doing, which is get out of Earth orbit, go explore the cosmos. And that's what we're going to do. Um, a, a lot ahead. Let's talk with Carol Costello. She's on a beach very near the Space uh, Center over in Port Canaveral. Uh, Carol, obviously uh, good news that the, the, the weather at this point is green, the weather is a go. Uh, that is certainly good news for the folks who are, have been waiting an awfully long time. Anderson, they have been waiting an awfully long time. I and mean, they've come from far and wide from all over the country. I met some people here from New Zealand and Australia who came here to Port Canaveral just to see this last shuttle launch. Let's talk to some of my friends from Canada. This is Steve and his son Adam. You've been here since 1 a.m. Eastern this morning. Oh my goodness, why? I just couldn't miss the last shuttle launch. I've wanted to see one for years and this is the end of an era and I just couldn't miss it. Why didn't you come before? Oh, family, work. It's just, uh... I ask you that because this is the kind of thing that NASA would have wanted to see through its history yeah. of the space shuttle. Yet here you are for the first time and the last time. Well, it takes a big commitment to get down here. It was uh, 22 hours of driving to come here. So, uh, uh, you know, with a family, it's hard to make that time sometimes. Oh, I can understand that. Adam, if this thing launches, and we believe it will so far, what do you expect it to be like? I don't know. I think I've seen too many uh, space movies. My, my expectations are pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fantastic, I'm sure. I want to come over here and talk to my friend from St. Louis because I posed to you a question. You're here to watch this final historic launch of the shuttle. Um, there've been a, there's been a lot of criticism of NASA, spending all of these tax dollars to do these missions. No one quite understands why these missions are going up. Is it worth it for you as a taxpayer to witness this and all the money it takes? I think it must be because this is the fifth time I've tried to see a shuttle, a shuttle launch. And I've only been successful once. I saw the last one. So to me, I'm kind of biased, you know. I have to say, yes, it is worth it. Uh, I think when people look at the numbers and how much money it really costs, it sounds like a lot at first, but in reality, uh, all of NASA's budget is less than uh, seven-tenths of one percent of the federal budget. 
And I think the long range plans that NASA has uh, to do the follow on to the shuttle using something based on Orion to do a possible asteroid mission, I think in the long run that's going to be really important along with safety. So that President Obama says we kind of need to, to change direction, NASA needs to change direction, that's okay by you? Yes, and that's something that's uh, gone back to the uh, Bush administration, so I think there's a lot of bipartisan uh, support for changing the basic way NASA does things. Okay, so we're hoping the shuttle goes off. We're hoping, Anderson, we got our fingers crossed and our toes, and hopefully everything will go as planned because, you know, people told me yesterday that a million people were going to invade this area to witness this launch. I did not believe them then, but boy, do I believe it now. Yeah, we actually left about uh, 6 a.m. from the, the inn where we were staying, which is only, a, you know, five or six miles from here because the traffic, we knew the traffic was going to be thick, and it was... Uh, it was thick. It took us quite a while to get here. A lot of excitement here. Uh, people selling T-shirts on the side of the road. I'm going to buy one of those T-shirts. I'm hoping they're discounted when they're on the way back, so I'm going to wait. I think I'm very clever for doing that. Hey, uh, but our, our coverage continues. Uh, all right, sounds good. Um, 11.26 is, the, uh, is when uh, the launch is supposed to occur. And again, it may be just be a nail biter. It might be down to the last minute before we know for sure whether or not uh, this is going to be the, the launch today. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. More from the excited families gathered at the visitor complex coming up. And we're waiting here from President Obama very soon. It's supposed to speak live in the Rose Garden. We'll bring that to you much more when we continue. Sounds like July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. For the first time in history, humans walk on the moon. Astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin spend nearly 24 hours on the lunar surface, collecting 47 pounds of moon rock as Michael Collins flies the module around the moon. The mission fulfills President Kennedy's goal of reaching the moon before the Soviet Union. A CNN top moment in space.